Good afternoon and welcome to the first lecture of History 2112. Sorry this isn't in person, but we have to quarantine and stay safe. I want to start out by saying I apologize if you hear anything in the background. I am home with a two and a half year old and he likes playing with toys. Uh, he's also torturing me with Bubble Guppies, if you know what that show is. And we've been watching Bubble Guppies nonstop now for about two months. So if anybody has any recommendations on new kid shows, I'll take them right now. But anyways, let's get going with this here. Um, I call this the Gilded Age and Change in America because this is going to be the period uh, right after the Civil War. And let's start with politics. Uh, I'm not going to go as into detail as I would in the classroom because I know I've got a limited amount of time to keep your attention. But let's talk just for a minute about presidential politics and congressional politics. And we're looking at the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s. Uh, when you get down to it, the presidents during this time, they're pretty forgettable. Uh, if I didn't have them written down, I probably couldn't name them, and I'm pretty good with the presidents. Um, some people call them the no-name presidents, or they call them the forgettable presidents. Uh, typically, these presidents are seen as very weak, and they're rarely discussed today. Uh, you've got Rutherford B. Hayes, who becomes president in 1877. It's kind of a dirty election, which I won't really get into, but you can research it if you're interested. But Rutherford B. Hayes, he makes a deal, if you elect me president, I'll end Reconstruction. And he does that. In 1877, he ends Reconstruction and says, okay, the Civil War is over. After he is done being president, we've got a guy named James A. Garfield. Uh, Garfield is assassinated because he doesn't give somebody a job. There used to be this thing called the spoils system where you would give your friends political positions. Well, there's one person that thought that James Garfield was going to give them a job, and he didn't, and the guy was mad and killed James Garfield instead. The next guy is Chester Arthur, who was Garfield's vice president. Uh, Chester A. Arthur, he does something called the Pendleton Act, and the Pendleton Act does civil service reform. Instead of getting your job through knowing somebody, uh, you're going to get your job through a civil service test. After that is Grover Cleveland, and then Benjamin Harris, who passed the Sherman Antitrust Act. And then, in a weird turn of events, Grover Cleveland becomes president again, but he's president during what's known as the Panic of 1893. Most of these guys are just content to hold office. They're very pro-business. Uh, they were f fans of business as long as they were good businesses. Uh, Congress was very pro-business as well, and Congress ran the show. There were some very, very powerful congressmen um, during this time, and they also believed that whatever was good for business was good for America. All right, moving on from there. Um, you also have this idea in the late 1800s that America was changing from these island communities to this connected country. Uh, during the Civil War and before, uh, you didn't really have a lot of connections throughout communities. Your local community was the important thing. But as the railroad and as the telegraph begins to connect Americans for the first time, we start to become this more... Uh, I don't, how do I want to say it? This more similar country, if you will. Uh, for the first time, democracy wasn't just local. You were concerned about nationwide politics. For the first time, education is going to become formal. And democracy, in many ways, is going to go from being personal and emotional to business-like or education-like. You also get this shift from America being an agricultural or agrarian society to this urban society. I mean, even as early as, say, World War I, America looked a lot more like it does today than it did during the Civil War. You have corporations that are going to become powerful, companies are going to become bigger, and farmers are going to start getting weaker. Now let's start talking about railroads. Um, railroads are actually going to be the first large-scale industry. 
Uh, if you've had U.S. History 1, you might have heard textiles were the first industry. That's true. But when we're talking about an industry on a large scale, it's going to be railroads. And railroads, they're founded in the 1830s, but they don't really get big until the 1840s and 1850s. And the reason for that is coal is going to be discovered in Pennsylvania, and that's going to lead to a growth in steam engines. Now, railroads are going to give this new technology um, called organization. Uh, railroads, you have to schedule. In fact, our time zones are a product of the railroads. You have to do bookkeeping, you have to do accounting, you have to do all this personnel management. And this is really the first time all of this has to be done. Because of all this new organization that has to be done, you get a full-time administrative group. You get men who are hired to maintain and supervise activities over this huge area of land. Uh, you have executives that have to monitor everything, coordinate everything, evaluate workers. And then you have these experts who are needed to make sure that the trains run on time, that railroads are working as they should and with their competition and everything else. Now, along with railroads often came telegraph lines. And telegraph lines, invented by Samuel Morse, allowed nationwide communication and even cross-country, cross-Atlantic communication. Before railroads and before telegraphs, it would take months to get information back and forth. Um, with a railroad, you could go across the country in like three or four days. And with telegraph lines, you could get information cross country in as little as six minutes. So both of those are really going to make the country much, much smaller. Once the railroads set up, uh, there is another thing you have to consider is even after World War, or even after the Civil War, up until World War One or so, there was a lot of change happening in the railroads. Um, like track sizes were going to be standardized, rates were going to be standardized, timekeeping methods are going to be standardized. But even with that going on, uh, there's a lot of cutthroat competition. Uh, your job was to put your your um, competitors out of business, and often that was done by driving the competitors into bankruptcy. So you would lose money, your competitor would lose money, it's just a matter of who's going to run out of money first. But after a while, things kind of settle down, and we start to get this idea of distribution. Uh, distributors, they're going to use these railroads to transport materials across the country, and they're going to use these telegraphs to take orders from across the country as well. So you get these large suppliers who are going to buy and sell, or in some cases even produce materials themselves, and they're going to get them out to buyers as quickly as they can. Now, some of the first to develop distribution networks are also conveniently going to be the first to come up with the idea of the department store. Marshall Fields, he is one of the earliest to come up with a true distribution network, becomes a department store, and eventually Marshall Fields is purchased by Macy. A.T. Stewart, there used to be a department store in New York called Stewart's. It was bought by John Wanamaker. Wanamaker had a, a uh, department store in Philadelphia, and at its largest it grew to, I think it was 15 or 20 stores throughout the, the East Coast. And then Roland Macy. Macy's is the one of all these that still exists, but it's having trouble too. But all of those people started distribution networks and later opened up department stores based on their distribution networks. Uh, two others that are eventually going to join Montgomery Wards, which still exists in a mail order only format, and Sears and Roebuck, which is barely hanging on right now, which is the Sears company. Both of those started as mail order companies. You could get a Sears catalog, you could send off via mail or by telegraph to the company, order something, and then it would show up a couple weeks later. That meant for the first time people in the middle of nowhere Kansas could order and wear and buy the same stuff as those living in New York City. Now to me the craziest thing is Sears used to sell homes. I've got a picture here of a Sears home 
there are Sears homes that you can still buy and live in all throughout the Midwest. In fact, my grandfather's house, he built himself after World War II based on a kit and a set of blueprints he bought from the Sears catalog. All right, moving on from there, you've got manufacturing. Uh, this is really the last area that takes advantage of these organizational systems, and this is really the last group that takes advantage of distribution and all of that. And it kind of, it's because technology has to catch up. Uh, it's not until you can build factories where materials flow continuously. It's not until you build machines that can run repeatedly that you can get true large-scale manufacturing. Some of the first examples of this, uh, there was a guy named James Duke who owned the American Ta Tobacco Company. He created the cigarette rolling machine that would automate that system. And then steel mills, such as the Carnegie Steel Company and U.S. Steel, they used automatic steel rollers that would allow them to ramp up and increase production. Eventually, these businesses are going to get big. And they are going to get big through the idea of integration. And I'm not going to bore you with economics or anything like that because that's another class but you do need to know these two very basic things about uh, economics when it comes to history there are two ways that these businesses became so large and there are two ways that these modern corporations are, were born one way was through the idea of vertical integration and the other one was through the idea of horizontal integration now with vertical integration uh, manufacturers would combine several parts of production together. They would combine the, the actual supply, the actual production, and then the distribution together. And one company would take care of all of these things. Uh, some examples, American Tobacco, that was the company of James Duke. Um, they controlled the, the tobacco plants, they controlled the production of tobacco, and then they they controlled the distribution of the finished products. He also did his own marketing too. Now some other examples were Pillsbury, who they were in charge of flour, uh, Campbell and Heinz, they did canned goods, uh, Procter and Gamble, they did soap, Eastman, George Eastman and the Kodak company, they did photography. Uh, you also had uh, some other companies like Armour and Swift, uh, they did meat packing. In fact, you can still buy armor uh, meat in the grocery store. Uh, not only did they control the farms, they controlled the production, and they controlled the distributing, they also bought refrigerated train cars that would allow uh, for the products to be distributed across the country. Uh, John McCormick, or not John McCormick, John Deere and the McCormick Harvester Company uh, they were distributing and building farm equipment. And there's even NCR, National Cash Registers. Uh, they had to provide special instructions on how those materials were used and how to run automated cash registers. Now with horizontal integration, that's done through mergers. And the whole idea of horizontal integration is to reduce competition. So one company would buy a smaller company a bigger company would result, and then you would find another company, so on and so on. Um, so mergers worked typically by cutting out the competition. Uh, some examples of, of competition, Standard Oil by uh, Rockefeller. Um, Rockefeller bought a bunch of smaller oil companies, and his Standard Oil got bigger and bigger and bigger. Carnegie Steel is eventually bought by J.P. Morgan. It's renamed U.S. Steel, and U.S. Steel is going to control, I saw a number once, 93% of all the steel made, not just in the country, but in the world. With this manufacturing, America is going to develop this permanent class of workers who were just managers. Uh, ownership and management of corporations become separate. Um, if you work for a big company, your owners don't work in that office. Your, your owners are going to be somewhere else. You're going to work just... Okay.
Okay, sorry about that bark there from my dog. Um, had an Amazon package, and it, you can't tell, but it's been about 10 minutes. My dog is still trying to bark, so I apologize. All right, moving on. Uh, we got to talk about these guys called robber barons just for a second. Uh, there's some famous names, and I'll talk about them a little bit later, but just want to introduce them. Um, what is a robber baron? It's a wealthy tycoon who holds a monopoly over certain industries. And I've just got a couple examples here. Andrew Carnegie, uh, he owned a company car called Carnegie Steel. Uh, at one point in time, he was the wealthiest man in the world. He controlled the entire steel industry. Eventually, he is going to sell his company to another guy on this list. We got Andrew Mellon. He controlled the entire aluminum industry, and he controlled something called the Coke industry. Now, I'm not talking Coca-Cola. Coke is a type of fuel used in steel production and aluminum production. J.P. Morgan, that's the guy who created General Electric, which today is one of the oldest and most venerated companies in the world. Um, he's going to go on to buy Carnegie Steel. He renames it U.S. Steel. He becomes a financial mogul. Um, you probably heard of the J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Um, he gets pretty rich. And then finally, John D. Rockefeller, he is going to become the founding member, founding uh, owner of Standard Oil, and he becomes the world's richest man after he passes Andrew Carnegie. Now, Standard Oil technically doesn't exist today, but in some ways it does. Now, um, if you ever go to BP, if you go to Chevron, if you go to Marathon, all of those right there are iterations of Standard Oil. Standard Oil is eventually going to be broken up into smaller companies. And most of those Standard Oil companies that came into being after the breakup of big Standard Oil do still exist. Now here's something else to talk about. Uh, there's this idea of social Darwinism. Now. Most people have heard of uh, Charles Darwin, survival of the fittest, and evolution. Well, social Darwinism it has nothing to do with Charles Darwin, but it's people that used his ideas, and it's this very conservative look at the world that was used by many in power and many wealthy people in the day. Now, there are two really big proponents of this idea of social Darwinism. There's a, a guy named Herbert Spencer, who was from Britain. And then there's a guy named William Graham Sumner, who was from uh, the United States. Uh, they both argued, and this is me simplifying this for us, the poor are unfit and should be eliminated by nature. It really is this idea of survival of the fittest. Like, for example, Spencer says that the poor are unfit and should be eliminated by nature, and um, Spencer also says that the government should not interfere with the natural process. Basically, these people are poor for a reason. It's a flaw in their character. It's a genetic defect, and the government should let these poor people die. Uh, then you have William Graham Sumner. Uh, he says that the progress of civilization depended on natural selection. And natural selection was a requirement of unrestricted competition. Uh, basically, William Graham Sumner says that society will not progress unless we get rid of the poor people. Now, from there, some people start using social Darwinism as a tool to promote racism. Uh, the best example of this is a guy named Reverend Josiah Strong. He wrote a book in 1885 called Our Country. And Josiah Strong, he believed in universal progress. He believed uh, in material progress and moral progress, but he said that Anglo-Saxons need to be protected. Uh, even Teddy Roosevelt, uh, he thought that there was going to be a race war or a racial conflict between white settlers and African Americans and white settlers and Native Americans, and that this race war was going to be inevitable. Um, there, was a, there were a lot of people who were threatened by immigration, Catholics, Mormons, cities, socialists, you name it. And social Darwinists found a way to use this to promote hate. Now, there are some people out there that were against it, 
Uh, two examples of people who were against social Darwinism, you've got Lester Ward. He wrote a book called Dynamic Sociology, and he is going to distinguish between what he called physical or purposeless evolution and mental or human evolution. He's going to say that the physical world and the mental world, those evolutions were separate from each other. Uh, he's also going to argue that the environment transforms the animal, but man transforms the environment. Therefore, you can't apply Darwinism to society because it just does not work. Now, Ward also said that competition was a bad thing. Um, unrestricted competition was harmful because it um, didn't allow people to um, make a better life for themselves. Um, he argued that it would purposely put the little man down and only the haves would succeed. And he would show that um, education was the playing field that leveled it for everybody. Um, education is the way to give poor and lesser uh, economically uh, adept people a chance to show off their talents and a chance to make something of themselves. So Ward was very, very strongly in favor of education. You also have Washington Gladden, who is a, uh, he's a preacher in Ohio, and he was afraid that a race riot or really a class riot would break out. Uh, he believed that uh, weaker classes would unite and attack the system. And he said, you know what? This idea of survival of the fittest in regards to civilization is not what a civilized society would do. Now, sadly, as social Darwinism, it's on the rise until about the 1890s, and it's right around the 1890s that it kind of starts to subside a little bit. It never really, truly goes away. Uh, I know people today in 2019 and 2020 and probably next year in 2021, who still call themselves social Darwinists. So there are a lot of people who still think this way. All right, let's look at labor conditions for a minute so you know kind of what's going on with uh, workers. Uh, first of all, a uh, typical work day. Um, you still have a lot of small workshops where the, the work is done by skilled artisans and that person controls their own pace of work, but that's kind of a dying way of doing things. A lot of the work you're going to find by the time we get to the late 1800s are in mechanized shops. Uh, in these mechanized shops, you're usually going to work 10 to 12 hours a day. You're going to work six days a week. And most workers, to make this even more difficult, are only going to work eight or nine months of the year. The pay is going to vary greatly depending on where you live. Uh, men in the north, $3 if you're skilled a day. $1.25 a day if you're unskilled. In the South, it's half of that. If you're a skilled worker in the South, you're making $1.50. If you are an unskilled worker, you're making about 75 cents. Women are making half of that. Uh, there's no concern for industrial safety. Uh, first of all, there's seasonal unemployment. There's no, um, there's no unemployment office. Nobody's working year-round. Um, Accidents are common, especially in industries like the steel industry, railroad industry, mining industry, textiles. Um, there is no, um, there's no, uh, what do you call it, uh, workers' compensation. If you get hurt, you're hurt and you're out of work. Uh, minor injuries can become bad because of lack of treatment. If you cut your finger, you have to go to work, which can make it worse. There's no modern medicine yet. That's not really going to happen until around World War I. Uh, 1913 alone, this is just one year, there's 25,000 fatalities that were because of work-related accidents and 700,000 injuries that were so bad that a worker was required to miss a month or more of work. There are also some diseases that are common in certain industries. Black lung is a coal mining industry. It's where you ingest and breathe in coal particles. Brown lung is where you breathe in textile particles. 
And white lung is from baking. All of those are debilitating diseases. Now what happens if you are considered a uh, disabled worker, there's no compensation for you, and the risk is considered something that you have accepted. Because you are willing to work in those industries, you have accepted that you can get hurt. There's no government safety net, no disability, no workers' comp. I can't stress that enough. So where do those people get help from? Usually fraternal organizations or family. That's about all there was. Women workers. By the time we get to the 1890s, there are quite a few workers who are in the, um, the workforce who are women. Typically, those can be domestic jobs, teaching jobs, nursing jobs. Uh, garment factories, cigar, cigarette factories, baking, and then you're going to get some secretarial work as well and some store clerk work as well. But secretarial work and store clerk work was previously dominated by males and women were just breaking in. Women are always going to be considered unskilled workers. Women are always going to be temporary workers. And yes, you still have kids in the workforce as young as five. Now, there are three Supreme Court cases that I do want you to, to know. Uh, I may or may not test you on this. I haven't decided yet. But they, you should at least know what they are. The first one is Holden versus Hardy from 1898. In Utah, there was a law passed that limited minors to eight hours a day of work. Uh, that was taken to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld the law because mining was hazardous. Then in 1905, we've got Lochner versus New York. New York State passed a law that limited bakers to a 10-hour workday for a total of 60 hours per week. And the Supreme Court is going to strike that law down simply because baking was not considered hazardous. And then you have Mueller versus Oregon in 1908. In the state of Oregon, um, there was a law that was set that said women working in laundry mats or in, in the, the laundry industry could only work a t maximum of 10 hours per day. That law was upheld because uh, women were said to be, uh, it was legal to treat women differently than men. Women were seen as the, the daintier sex, if you will. And so it was okay to limit women in how long they could work. So those are really the first three Supreme Court cases that dealt with the idea of uh, labor. Now there are some strikes. In 1877 uh, there was a railroad strike. Uh, it was caused by this depression that broke out in 1873 known as the Panic of 1873. And because of this decade-long depression uh, the amount of business being done on railways started to go down. And because the railways weren't making them as much money, the rail company started to cut the worker pay. Well, workers on the B&O, meaning Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, uh, they go on strike and they block the railway. Eventually, the railroad strike is going to expand from there. And when we get workers in Pittsburgh who are striking uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad is going to shut down, and the owners of the Pennsylvania Railroad are going to bring in these private, these private uh, security guards known as Pinkertons. The Pinkertons are going to be told to break the strike. The Pinkertons are going to be violent towards the striking workers. The striking workers are going to fight back, and then there's this gun battle that breaks out in the city of Pittsburgh. Eventually, several state militias are going to be called out, and as a last-ditch effort to stop it, President Rutherford B. Hayes calls in the U.S. Army not to stop the strike, but because they wanted to protect the mail. And there are some very famous pictures you can find on Google of uh, railroad locomotives with federal troops on them to make sure that the mail could get through the strike. As a result of the Knights of the... Uh, the strikes of 1877, the Knights of Labor is formed by a gentleman named Terence Powderly. Now, Terence Powderly, he was this Irish Catholic, uh, very dynamic speaker, and he was the president of the Union. 
And the basic belief of the Knights of Labor was that the producer of goods, meaning the laborers, deserve the fruits of his or her work. Or labor creates value. Many of the new workers came from farming backgrounds where a farmer works and they get paid for their product. And these farmers thought, well, when we go work in a factory, it should be that same thing. I should get paid for the value of what I produce. Now, obviously, businesses don't always work that way. Now, the membership for the Knights of Labor was open to everybody, and they tried to do their business through collective bargaining. Uh, with that being said, though, you could not be a gambler, you could not be a land speculator, you could not be a lawyer, banker, or doctor. And wow, I put bankers on there twice. Glad to see I was paying attention. But you could not be any of those things because they were considered dishonest. Now, what did the Knights of Labor support? They supported greenbacks, meaning paper money. They wanted the government to regulate health and safety. Uh, they wanted public ownership of railroads. They wanted public ownership of telegraphs. They wanted equal pay for women, and they wanted worker-owned cooperatives. Think of like Publix, which is worker-owned. They're not the only labor union of the day, though. Uh, the Knights of Labor, they're very successful. And up until 1886 or so, the Knights of Labor, they're the, the number one union but they're so successful, they almost put themselves out of business. Uh, in 1886, the American Federation of Labor is founded by another man named Samuel Gompers. And Samuel Gompers, uh, he is this English immigrant, and he believed that you had to get what you, what you deserve through collective bargaining. Now, unlike the Knights of Labor that was open to all wage earners, uh, the... AFL was only open to craft guilds, people who made stuff and were skilled. If you were an unskilled laborer, you're not welcome. You have to be able to make something. He also did not want women in the AFL, and he did not want African Americans either. On top of that, immigrants were discouraged from joining. They weren't expressly banned, but immigrants were discouraged. Now, the way that the AFL worked is they tried to set up union shops. They tried to do collective bargaining within the company. They tried to avoid strikes, and they tried to stay out of politics. Now, the AFL is still around today, but today it's known as the AFL-CIO. Now, we got a couple of riots you got to talk about, too. Uh, the first one is the Haymarket Riot. This happens in Chicago. It's on the west side of the loop. And it happens in May of 1886 outside a McCormick Harvester plant. Uh, McCormick Harvester, they made farming implements. Think of like pre-tractors pre and other things that people use out in the field. Well, in May of 1886, there was a labor protest outside the factory where people were protesting their pay and how long they worked. And four workers were killed on May 3rd outside of the plant during a strike by police. Well, the next day, the labor strike continues, and somebody, nobody knows who, somebody throws a bomb into the crowd. Seven policemen are killed. Four protesters are killed when the police open fire. Eight labor activists are arrested. There's absolutely no evidence that links these eight labor protesters to the, the bombing. These eight labor activists are arrested for murder. It goes to trial. They're all convicted. Four are executed. One commits suicide. That should be one commits suicide, not three. And then three who survive are pardoned by the Illinois governor. Now, you also have the Pullman Strike, which begins on May 11th, 1894. It's, it's in a place called Pullman, uh, Illinois, which is today a suburb of Chicago. Basically, it was a company town created by George Pullman that was meant to build the Pullman uh, train cars. Well, in 1894, the Pullman Palace Car Company cuts the wages of its workers by 25%. 
the workers are angry and they want to meet with the owner, George Pullman, and they, George Pullman refuses. So the workers go on strike and when they walk out of the factory, the factory owners and management lock the doors behind the workers. When word of this gets out, the strike grows, and there are railroad employees across the country that refuse to hook up Pullman cars to the locomotives. Before you know it, the entire train system breaks down. Uh, there's violence that breaks out because federal troops are called in again to deal with the strike and get the trains moving again. Uh, by the time the Pullman strike ends, public opinion has turned against the striking workers because of the violence and they are forced to go back to work at a reduced rate, and eventually the Pullman Train Car Company will go out of business. Now, what about farmers? i, I got to talk about them. Uh, this whole idea of mechanization and spread of railroads, it's really going to affect farmers a lot more than you think. Uh, there are towns set up across the country following the railroads. Uh, these new towns are going to give the farmers a way to access the markets back east or the big city markets. So there's going to be more pressure on the farmers to produce, and the farmers are going to become more profit-oriented than they were before. New machinery and chemical fertilizers are going to come from the cities. They're going to be available for farmers to use, but it's going to be at a premium. Uh, of course, whenever new technology comes out or new, new equipment comes out, it's going to be more expensive. Just think of the iPhone 12 that's going to come out. It's going to be probably you know, close to $1,000. Now, farmers, they, they realize that these banks are necessary evils. The railroad is necessary evil, but they don't trust them. They know that these banks, these railroads, all these companies are charging them too much, but there's nothing they can do because they need them. The farmers are going to develop these things called farmers' alliances. Uh, think of it like a uh, labor union for farmers. Uh, I mean, the government was not doing anything to help them. The government was all about business. In fact, there's a famous saying, the business of business is business. That's going to come out in the early 1900s. So there's falling agricultural prices. There's not enough money going around. There's high interest rates. There's high debt. There's these farmers being overcharged. And farmers were starting to lose out big time. So these farmers, they're going to organize these unions known as the Grange and known as the Farmers Alliances. And there are four major Farmers Alliances. There's the Southern Farmers Alliance, the National Colored Farmers Alliance, the Northwestern Farmers, Farmers Alliance, meaning like Midwest, and the National Farmers Alliance. They were originally cooperatives, meaning that these farmers would buy and sell stuff together, uh, think economy of scale, collective bargaining. If there are more of you bargaining, then there's more likelihood you're going to succeed. But eventually it's going to turn from this farmer's cooperative into this big political movement. Uh, by the 1890, the different farmers alliances, they had helped across the country get people elected to office. Uh, there were four governors that were elected and the farmers alliance uh, they controlled 11 state legislatures. There were enough people in 11 states who were friendly to farmers that they were willing to help farmers. Now, they also elected three U.S. senators and 50 congressmen. While important, there's not a whole lot that's, that can be done on the national level, but it is good to note that there was some national success, too. This is going to become the People's Party or the Populists. In 1892, members of these alliances meet in Omaha, Nebraska, and they decide that they're going to create this political party. And what this political party wants, they want tariff reductions, meaning import tax reductions. They want a graduated income tax. The more money you make, the more tax you should pay. The less money you make, the less tax you should pay. They want public ownership of railroads. They want public ownership of telegraphs because they think private ownership is making the rates go too high. And they want free silver. Uh, this is, hopefully this makes sense through a video like this instead of me doing it in person. Once upon a time, American money was on something called the gold standard, meaning 
for every dollar in circulation, there had to be gold to back it up somewhere, uh, Fort Knox or wherever it might be. The United States today is not on the gold standard. That is going to change in the 1970s. Today, uh, American money is just backed up by the good faith of the American government. In fact, nobody even knows if there is gold still in, left in Fort Knox. There probably is, but there's no way to prove it. But in the 1880s and 1890s, for every dollar in circulation, there was a dollar of gold sitting somewhere in the American bank. What free silver would have done is change us from the gold standard to the silver standard. And silver, it's a little bit more common. It's not worth as much, meaning that more money could have been printed. The money would have been worth less and it would have been easier to get. So free silver would have put more money in circulation, which would have helped the farmers. Now, a guy named Leonidas Polk, he was the head of the National and Southern Farmers Alliances. He was supposed to be the presidential candidate, but he was on his way to the convention in Omaha and he dies of a heart attack. So at the last minute, Leonidas Polk has to be replaced by a guy named James Weaver. And James Weaver becomes the populist candidate for the 1892 presidential election. Now the populists, they're gonna get over a million votes, which is eight and a half percent of the total votes cast. Pretty good for a third party, especially a third party that formed out of thin air. Uh, five senators are going to be elected, Tom, 10 congressmen, three governors. But there are some weaknesses shown in this 1892 election. For example, the Populist Party gets no support in the New England, no support in the urban areas, no support in the Midwest, which is like Chicago and Milwaukee. There's also no support from organized labor. Now, go into 1896, and the populist movement is going to die a very sudden death. Uh, the nation is going to go into a depression in 1893. It's going to last till 1897. It's the worst ever depression at the time. Uh, unemployment goes as high as 25%. Farm prices drop. And it really looks like it's the populist party time to shine. Unfortunately, there, was, there were large-scale demonstrations, there was violence, the middle class and the upper class was scared of what was happening. On top of that, the Democratic Party is going to adopt and basically steal the ideas of the populist party. Free silver becomes a huge symbolic issue and free silver is going to be the number one topic taken up by the Democratic Party. Now the Populist Party, they're not happy with this, but there's not a whole lot they can do. The Democratic Party is going to enlist a guy named William Jennings Bryan to be their candidate. He's this 36-year-old lawyer. He's from Nebraska. He'd been in Congress before. And he is very much in support of the farmers. He's very much in support of the little man, if you will. The populists, they go along with the Democrats up to a point. Both the Democratic Party and the populist party nominate William Jennings Bryan to be their presidential candidate. But the populists, they choose a different vice president. The Republicans, they're going to nominate a senator from Ohio named William McKinley. William McKinley and William Jennings Bryan are like polar opposites. Uh, Bryan wants to lower tariffs. McKinley promises to raise tariffs. Bryan wants the free silver. William McKinley maintains the gold standard. Bryan is supported by little people and farmers. McKinley, supported by big business. Completely separate ideas. In the end, Brian is going to be made to look like this wild-eyed radical. Scares a bunch of people. McKinley is made to look like this good, God-fearing man. And McKinley is going to beat Brian by about 600,000 votes. So it's, it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty drastic there. Okay, so hopefully next week we'll be in person. Um, there is going to be a quiz. I have to know that you 
watch this. So there's going to be a quiz, one question for you. And I like to call this the secret word. So there's going to be a quiz put down. This is an addition to the regular quiz. And I want you to give me this word. Type this word into the question or into the answer box. Bubble. B-U-B-B-L-E. Bubble. That's because I am, yet again, watching bubble guppies with my two-and-a-half-year-old. So the word is bubble, B-U-B-B-L-E. Type that word into the question or into the answer box for the secret word quiz. Now for this week, here's what you need to do for this week. You have to do the first discussion. The first discussion is two questions long. To do the first discussion, you need to read uh, about the Pullman strike, which is in the readings folder. You need to either listen to or read the Cross of Gold speech, which is also in the readings folder. You will have the Chapter 16 quiz to do, and you get the answers to the Chapter 16 quiz by reading through the book. So you've got the secret word quiz, you've got the Chapter 16 discussion, and you've got the sh Chapter 16 quiz. And with any luck, we'll see each other on Monday. Or, if you're at Douglasville, we'll see you on Thursday. Either way, I look forward to seeing you again. Hope you're all staying safe, and I hope you're all healthy. Bye-bye.